speed the work. Okay, my recording is up and we are live so we can begin. We always need to make sure that the recording is up. You can see my screen and I am not muted because there's someone who's gonna watch this late. So you can imagine the frustration of watching what 30 minutes or 45 minutes and you can't hear a thing. Okay, so I'm gonna need two, or not two, in fact, I'm gonna need two favors from you. So if you can see my screen, there's a part where it has notifications. So people who are trying to join the meeting are gonna request to join in. So those who see a pop up saying there's someone on the lobby, please make sure that you admit those people so that they can join the session and benefit as much as you are going to be. So please do me that favor. If you see someone trying to enter the meeting or you see a pop up thing on the lobby, something, please admit that person. Then the second but last request is that if there's a mate of yours or classmates in the chat section and sends a message, please read the message for me. Because once I go to the screen where I'm writing, I cannot see what people are typing. And some of them are probably in libraries, so it makes sense why they cannot use their mic. So if you can afford to use your mic and you see a question on the chat section, please read it. Me answering the question might all benefit you. So I cannot see the question on the chat section once I go to the screen where I am, right, I am writing. So for the last time, give me a thumbs up. I need Need to see thumbs ups on the screen. I need to be motivated, and then we go and start working. Kidding, I do not need more motivation. Okay, great. So let's go to the screen. So someone has their their hand up. So please go ahead. Does anyone who has a question in advance feel free to unmute and shoot or write in the chat section? One of your classmates is going to read the question to me. Right, I don't see any hand up and I do not see any notification on the chat section. So let me go to my screen where I'm going to be writing. OK, so. Let me delete these two. So before we kick start, there's, there's one thing which I want to say, which is. Those who did not watch the session which we which we had on Sunday, I really recommend that you go and watch that se session. So there's valuable insights which you can take away from there. Believe me, it's going to be good use of your time. So I really advise those who did not watch that section to go back, but not section, but session. Those who did not watch the session to go and have a look at what we are doing. You will take something which is useful home. So today, unlike Sunday, we are not going to be really doing an introduction, but we have done a reasonable amount of work today, which is go over questions which are from tutorial one. <coughs> this last year's tutorial one, and it also looks like the tutorial one of the year twenty. 21, but even 2020. So it didn't change much. So if you can be able to understand what we are doing, then come next week or the week after, you will do just OK for your tech test or tutorial test. OK, so obviously our focus is, as you know, as you all know, is mathematical modeling. Specifically for this part of the course, it is dimensional analysis. So let me write mathematical modeling here. And then specifically, we are looking at dimensional analysis. And if you recall, we said the reason why we are doing dimensional analysis is because we are going to be given parameters which we do not know how they relate 
Another question which will come about is how do those parameters relate? How is parameter one related maybe to parameter four? Okay. And we said for us to even start doing the work, if you recall, we introduced or I introduced what we call a dimensionless quantity. We'll go to the next page and have a look at what we mean, but we introduced what we refer to as a dimensionless quantity. And the question is, what is that? Well, the session we had answers that question, but we said when we say, when we are speaking of the fundamental dimensions, we'll focus on the following. So when we refer as, or when we speak of the fundamental dimensions, we said our focus will be on mass. It will be, mass will be denoted by M. So you should not confuse fundamental dimensions and units. So we said we'll focus on mass, then we'll focus on time, and time will denote it using T, and then we'll also focus on length, of which length will denote as L. So one thing I need you to note here is that fundamental dimensions When we speak of these, these are not, they are not equal to units or standard units. We are not, we are not looking at those. So when we say mass, you should not think of kg. When we say time, when we speak of dimensional analysis, you should not think of as in like seconds or minutes. When we get the idea of time, when we represent time in its dimensional, analysis or dimension form will denote it using T. When we hear mass, we'll put in M. And when we hear anything which has to do with length, be it radius, we'll denote it with L. So as long as there's length somewhere, whether they are saying it's radius, it's parameter, whatever that is, as long as it's length, we'll denote it with L. Okay, so dimensions are not equal to units. We should be careful. Mass in dimensional analysis, we just put in M, we will not put in cages, anything of that nature. And then just to take you a step back, this is the table which you need to know. It is there on your study guide. So if you look at the table, what we have on the first column, this is the, let me call it quantity or let me call it parameter, rather. And then what we have on the second column is the dimension, dimensions. And then what we have here, these are simply units. And they are written in standard form, so these are units. And then equally so, in those ones are units. But our focus, since we are doing dimensional analysis is on these. That's where our focus is because what we are doing is called dimensional analysis. That's what our focus in is. We don't care about cages. We don't care about meters and whatnot. We focus on the dimensions. When we speak of cages, what is it? It has to do something with mass. So we print M the meters. Well, it sounds like length. So we'll print L. S, that's for second, it sounds like time. And then density, it is mass over volume, if you remember. So there's the mass. Then volume, remember, it is L cubed. So volume is something meters cubed. That's why we have L cubed here. But the sign is negative was we pushed it up to the numerator. You should check out the previous video if this does not make sense, because we did derive some of these. But you really need the dimensions for you to even start 
working on a problem. And what was communicated to you in the group was that you need to make sure that you print this table. So if you don't print it, you should handwrite this table. So you cannot be working on problems when you need to scroll very far for you to find this table. So you have two options. Tomorrow, you either print the table at school and then you have it on your wall in your room. And another one, you always carry it with you. Or you handwrite the table. You have a copy which stays in your room that you place. And then you have another one which you always carry with you. So that's my advice. So with that said, we said the dimensions are the important part because we are looking at dimensional analysis. So we might as well just jump straight to questions. So if you look at our question one of tutorial one. Is. We write tutorial one here. So if you look at question one. We need to first let me detail the steps for you when you approach these questions. So let me say step one. What you should do when you look at these questions is list the parameters in the problem. So meaning the first thing we should do when we look at dimensional analysis is what am I given? So I need to take that and then make it bullet forms so that I can clearly see what exactly am I given? So let's quickly read the question. So they're saying, consider a soap bubble with radius R. The pressure inside the bubble, let me do this. So they're saying, consider a soap bubble with radius R. The pressure inside the bubble must be greater than the pressure outside the bubble. The surface tension of the bubble supports the difference in pressure, in pressure, which is just delta P. Then they are saying, as the question, using dimensional analysis, formulate an expression for the pressure difference. Okay, so we'll stress later about what the question says. But for now, let us list what we are given. So I'll go here and make a point. So when I read my question, I can see that they gave me, they spoke about radius as a parameter of interest. So I'm just going to say radius, which is denoted by R. Okay, and then let's carry on and see. What else are we given? We carry on. They are telling us the long story. The pressure is that, that, that. And then they come and they give us the surface tension, which is denoted by the sign here. Surface tension. So let's write it down. So we are also given surface tension. And the sign which denotes it is that. Sorry. That's the surface tension. Then also, if you scroll and you scroll, they talk about the pressure difference as also being something of interest. So I come here, and when I look, I have the pressure difference. And the pressure difference is denoted by change in P. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, these are my three parameters of interest which I'm able to pick up from the problem. And then step number two, after picking up your parameters of interest, you should write them or you should write the dimensions or the fundamental dimensions 
of those parameters. So step two, we'll say, write the fundamental dimensions of the parameters listed on step one. So that's what we need to do. We need to take radius and ask ourselves, what is radius when we look at its fundamental dimension? So I will just say here radius, and then I will come here and say dimension. And then I will have below surface, tension, and then I will have pressure difference. So the page or, or the table on the previous page comes in useful when we now need to write the dimensions. So let's go to the previous page. Radius, we have no confusing that this is some form of length. So for radius, I'm just gonna go straight and put L. Okay, then let me see if this table of mine has surface tension. Let us see. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Surface tension, there you go. So my table does have surface tension, look here. That's my surface tension. And what I'm looking for is that, which is M T minus two, if I can see properly. Okay, let's go and put it in there. So it is M T minus two. And then we also have pressure difference. It's just the difference in pressure, meaning I need to go and look for the dimensions for pressure. So let's go to our useful table and see if we can see pressure anywhere. So let's see where is pressure. P, 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 P. There's, let's see. There is our pressure. There's our pressure. Okay. So this is what we we have. Our pressure is it is m l to the negative one, t to the negative two. Anyone else who has the study guide, please confirm whatever reason my resolution decreased here. So anyone who can open that PDF of your study guide, just go to the last page, the second last page, and then check pressure for us. Is it M, L negative one, T negative two? Please confirm. Anyone in the meeting, just go to the groups and then open that PDF. Yes, yeah, sir, it's the one. Okay, no problem. So it is ML negative one, T negative two. Thank you. Because we do not want to make mistakes there. So it is ML negative one, T negative two. Okay, so please check surface tension for me if it is there on that table. Is it M? T minus two. Anyone? Yes, 
is it the same? So all dimensions are correct. Can you please repeat? It sounds like you are far. Please repeat. Go ahead. All dimensions are correct. OK, no problem. Thank you. So I just wanted to confirm that. So let's go to step three. We now have our dimensions and we now have our parameters of interest listed and we are clear where we are going. So step three. Step three, you need to determine what we call the number of groups. So this is not complicated, really. So step three, we need to determine the number of groups. What do we mean by groups? What we mean is we need to determine how many dimensionless groups are we going to be able to form. Okay. And how we find that number, I'll say here NO, which is number of groups. That number will be, it will be the number of parameters. which is what we have found in three of them. And then the number of fundamental dimensions that appear on the problem or on the parameters. So what this means in, hum in human language is that the number of parameters, as you can see here, it is one, two, we have three parameters. So let's just say P is three. We have three parameters. And then what we mean by the second statement, this one, that the number of fundamental dimensions which appear Remember that when we say fundamental dimensions, what we are looking at is time or T, and then we are looking at mass, and then we are looking at length. So there's three of them in total, but there are problems where only two of them are gonna show up. So we need to go to our problem after writing it on its fundamental dimensions. There we can see L. There we can see M and we can see T. So it means the number of fundamental dimensions is three. So for example, let's say the T's were not there or the M was not there. We're only going to have two dimensions because we just have the L and then we just have the L. That's what appears when we look at all our dimensions. There's no M anywhere. So for this reason, here it is going to be three because we can see the M is there, the T is there, and the L is also there. So fundamental dimensions, it will be three of them. So I'll make a comment here. And the reason why I'm doing this or calculating the number of groups is because you will, um, you will encounter problems where when you take the difference, you get a number. So for example, here, when you do the number of groups, you will have three minus three, which is zero. And then this zero here does not mean we can't form a dimensionless group. Okay. So the problem, so for example, at some point, we will solve and maybe find the number of groups to be one. So when you have zero or one, things are looking okay. When you start having a number of groups, which are two, that's when you start need to stressing about, if you look at our previous session, that's when you need to stress about the geometric property, the fluid property, and 
the flow property. That is when you have two or more groups. So let me make a note for you to see later. So I'll say when number of groups is equal to two or more. Now, when choosing your groups, you need to now consider. Let me not say now, let me rather say then. Then you need to consider to consider your choice of of groups carefully. That's what you need to do. So when the number of groups is two or more, that's when you need to start choosing your groups carefully. That's when you need to start, start if you look at our previous session, that's when you need to stress about the geometric parameters. That's when you need to stress about the flow parameters, and that's when you need to stress about the fluid parameters. So since we, we have zero here, we don't need to stress about the number of groups. We'll just multiply the parameters and make them and equate them to a dimensionless quantity. So I will say no stress here. And also when you get one, you also should not stress. You just multiply all the given quantities and then equate them to a dimensionless quantity. Okay, so let's, let's do exactly that. So we have radius. Let's go to the next page and start constructing our dimensionless group. So let me add a page here. And while I add a page, do we have anyone who has a question? Please go ahead. Right. Um, so so, am I audible? You are loud and clear. Uh, do this geometric flow and fluid properties apply to all problems, or is it problems which involve uh, pressure, uh, volume, and all those properties? So they 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 apply to to all problems. Just that you do not need to stress about them when your number of groups is zero or it is one. But okay. If we get a problem where the number of groups is two. That's when we need to start looking at our problem and say, okay, let's choose a flow property, let's choose a geometric property, and let's choose a fluid property. If, if a fluid property is not there, you'll be forced to choose either a geometric or a flow pro property because you must you must select three at the end of the day: fluid, geometric, and flow. So if one of them is not there on the parameters, then it means you must repeat one of the two parameters or the two kind which is there. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yes. So please check out the previous video where the case where we had to repeat. I don't remember if it was a flow or a geometric property, but let's take this problem and carry on. So this is what we have. This was our, let's go to step four. So now that we have to choose the number of when it's one, when it's zero or it's one, we have no problem. We take all given variables, multiply them, equate them to a dimensionless quantity. So our step four will be construct a dimensionless product. And what does that mean? It means take the given variables, multiply them with each other, change in pressure, then equate them to a dimensionless quantity. So remember, dimensionless, we said there's no mass, that's why it's to the power of zero, there's no length, and there's no time. So this here is a is dimensionless. Because guess what? M to the zero, meaning there's no mass, L to the zero, there's no length, 
t to the zero, there's no time. So you take what you are given, the variables which you are given, you multiply them to form a product, but that product should be dimensionless. That's why we equate to m to the zero, l to the zero, and t to the zero. And then what you need to do after multiplying them, you need to consider exponents. So we'll just give variables to exponents. The R I'll make it to the power of A. Surface tension I'll make it to the power of B. The change in pressure I'll make it to the power of C. It's what you are always going to do when you construct a product. And then now after constructing my product like this, I need to write what I have above here in fundamental dimensions. So let's go and do exactly that. So it's going to be our R, it is length. So it's going to be length to the A. Our surface tension, it is M T minus two. We choose that on the previous page. Please have a look. Our change in pressure, let me have a look. I forgot. It is M L to the negative one, T to the negative two. To the C, and then this will be M zero, L zero, T zero. Okay. So, if you look carefully, we will distribute the exponents here as you would do. Distribute the expose or exponent. So when you distribute the exponents, what you will see is that we will have L to the A multiplied by M to the B. And then by exponential laws, it will be T to the minus two B. Okay, then times it will be M to the C. It will be L to the minus C. Then it will be T to the minus two C. I hope this is clear to all the minus two is that. So I just use grade nine exponential laws here where you say A to the M to the N is the same as say, a M N. That's what I did. There, in case you cannot see how I distributed these exponents. And then, obviously, we should not forget to equate them to a dimensionless quantity M0, L0, T0. We are doing dimensional analysis here, so we should not forget to equate to such. And then, what we need to do is we multiply the common dimensions here. So I will say combine or collect similar dimensions. So imagine at vets we are doing high school maths. So you have L's here. You have L's, you have M's, and then you have T's. When you multiply two, let me call them two parameters with the same base. If you're looking at exponential laws, for multiplying with the same base, I simply add the exponents. So let's look at L. So if you look at L, I have A, and then I have minus C. So I'm gonna add them. A plus minus C is just the same as A minus C. It is high school. And then let's go to our M. Similar base, we need to deal with the M's now. So we have M to the B. We have another M here, which is the C. And we are multiplying them. And the base is the same, and we are multiplying. We simply add the exponents. So this is going to be M to the power of B plus C. Dot. Let's go ahead and carry on. We are left with T. We still have work which we need to do. T. There's T. There's another T. Same base. When we multiply them, we add the exponents. So we can see a minus 2B there. 
and then in minus 2c. So let's go ahead. Our t will be minus 2b, which is that, and then minus 2c, which is that. And then this should equal to m to the power of 0, l to the power of 0, and t to the power of 0. And guess what? We need to do high school math. The L on the left hand side is to the power of A minus C. The L on the right hand side is to the power of zero. So the L's should have the same powers at the end of the day. So your brain should be firing something like this. The brain should be saying, I see that that needs to be equal to that. And I can see that this here, which is to the power of m, it needs to equal to what is on the right hand side to the power of m. And then what is to the power of c here needs to be t. So it needs to be equal to what is to the power of t there. That's what your brain is supposed to tell you now. So we can go ahead and solve for the a, the b, the c, and then conclude the problem. So let's paste it here. And then let me pause for a second. Do we have a question on the chat section? Do we have anyone who's raising their hand? There's no question on the chat section and you don't see anyone who raised their hand. Please give me a yes and then we continue. Okay, no problem. So now we need to solve for the exponents. What does that mean? It means when we look at L, for example, when we look at the left hand side, and then we look at the right hand side. So our left hand side, when we look at L, it is to the power of A minus C, but this should be equal to what is on the right hand side, which is zero. Let me power my tab. I didn't see this part. Okay, great. So if you look at L, the left hand side is A minus C, the right hand side is zero, so this means our A should be equal to our C. Okay, and what I said to you guys last time was that you should choose the easiest value when you have such a situation. So the easiest value you can choose is just the one. You can choose C to be one, which will give you A, or you can choose A, which gives you C. So let's choose the easiest value. Choose, let's say C is one. So if we choose C is one, we end up getting A is equal to one. Okay, so we are done dealing with the, the L. So let's go to the M. Equally so for the M, I'm gonna look at the right, the left hand side. I have Excuse B plus me, C. Sir. Please go ahead. Why why would you choose C to be equal to one? Is that an assumption or do you, do you just know natural? It, it is it is not an assumption. It okay, let me show you something. So you guys are doing maths. Let's carry on. Let's not choose it. It's not gonna breed any confusion. Worry not. Let's carry on. I'll show you why it was it's easy to choose it then. So let's look at M. When we look at M on the right hand side, what you have is the zero. So which means our B is equal to minus C. Okay. And then let's go to T. When you look at T, the left hand side is negative 2B minus 2C. The right hand side is zero. When you transpose, you will have minus 2b 
equals to C. And then when you divide, you will see that our B is equal to negative C. Okay, so you are finding exactly the solution which we have above. So now that you have these, you can see that these are in terms of, of variable. You can't really make much. But in fact, you can make use of, of them. So you have two options when you do not choose. You either represent every variable in terms of one variable. So let me say we have two options here. Which is choose one variable and I will say give it a simple value say one okay that's option number one and then option two which also is right is represent every variable every variable the exponents we are trying to solve in terms of one variable what this means is that for example if i solve for a it should be in terms of a certain variable. If I solve for B, it should be in terms of that variable. If I solve for C, it should be the same thing. So if you look at our A, our A is equal to C. So it is in terms of C. Our B is also in terms of C. So this would work. We can go back and plug in and things are going to work. But my suggestion is just choose as early as you can. So let's plug in and then you'll see how the choosing would work. And when you plug in, you go back to the original expression where you have your a your b and your c so now i will say at a page at a page and conclude so now we'll say plug back in back in so let's paste that. So if you remember, what we have is that our A is equal to, our A is equal to C, our B is minus C. Obviously C is equal itself. So meaning we can represent everything in terms of C. Thing in C. So if we go above here, it means we are going to have R to the C because our A is equal to C. And then we are going to have the surface tension to the power of our B is equal to our negative C. And then change in pressure, it is to the power of C. And then this is equal to M0, L0, and T0. And remember, this is a dimensionless quantity. So I will choose to put in K, dimension less quantity. So what we can see here is that when you sort these out, you just have change in pressure to the power of C, and then multiplied by R to the power of C over, because the exponent is negative, that surface tension comes below. And then this I will equate to K where K is just a dimensionless quantity. So for example, three, if I'm not assigning any units to three, and I just say three, three is a dimensionless quantity. So this K here is dimensionless. And it is just the proportionality constant. Okay, and if you look carefully, when we look at our solution, you can see that our change in pressure times our radius over our surface tension 
the common exponent is C. And this should be our K. And then from here, you can just raise the right hand side. Raise. The right hand side. And left hand side. To. The power. 1 over C in order to remove that C. OK, so if we do that, if you look carefully, our answer is just going to be. Our change in pressure times radius over surface tension, it will be another just dimensionless quantity because I've raised the power both sides. Let's just call it K1, which is still a dimensionless quantity. So now that we have this, let's go and look at what our question was saying. So our question was saying, formulate an expression for the pressure difference, meaning give us an equation which would give us the pressure difference, meaning do dimensional analysis and make the pressure difference the subject. So I'm going to go to my expression here and say, let's just make the pressure difference a subject. So if you solve for it, you will see that you'll have your K1 here, which is just the proportionality constant, and then it will be multiplied by surface tension over the radius. So this would be your answer. So your change in pressure is simply given by K1, proportionality constant, surface tension over R. This is the solution or the answer that we're looking for. And if you remember when we were doing our introduction to dimensional analysis, we said we'll be given a problem where there's many variables. We do not know how they relate. Then they will ask you, how is this, this, this variable related to the other one? So what we can see here in our solution is that our change in pressure was we were speaking about the bubble. Remember this problem. It's about a bubble which is formed from soap. So if you can imagine what's going on, think of, of this as if you are washing, and then the bubble sits on the surface. And then there's the radius which you can measure of the bubble. And then there is the pressure outside. And then there's the pressure inside. And then there's the surface tension, which we were given. Surface tension of the bubble. And then the question is more like, how is the change in pressure related to the radius and the surface tension? And looking at our formula just here, you could easily tell whoever is asking the question that the change in pressure is directly proportional to the surface tension. And the change in pressure is inversely proportional to one over the radius, meaning if we increase the radius, we are decreasing the change in pressure. And if you decrease the radius, you're increasing the change in pressure. And if you think of this carefully, and when you are not under, under pressure, it makes sense. So you can see already that there is application in real world scenarios where dimensional analysis is useful. But why would you be looking for pressures of bubbles? I genuinely do not know, but it is what it is. Do we have any questions regarding this question? It will not start making sense after the session. Save your safe. Save yourself time and then just pause the question and we answer it. So. Yes. Why do we say, why do we not stress when we have N as zero and when N is one? So my why answer are we to that still question. using the same, um, why are we still using the same dimensionless quantity like m to the power 
power zero, L to the power zero, and T to the power zero, isn't that equal to one? Yes, but remember, we are not looking at, we are looking at the dimensions. So for example, do you know that three, when I look at its dimensions, it is M zero, L zero, and T zero. So that's why when I was now introducing the variables back, I decided to make this to be just K, proportionality constant. Because as long as the proportionality constant is dimensionless, it is the same as saying that. However, 3KG would just be M. I wouldn't put the three there because the focus is on the dimension, not the value. Do you understand? Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Any other question? Okay, there's no question. Let's go to the second question, which is question two. And then I will leave question three as homework for you. So let's look at question two. This is still under tutorial one. If you can understand this, you need to up upload yourself, tutorial one. So if you remember step one, we said we need to list the parameters. So let's list. Has. So we go straight to the problem and we start listing them. So they are saying, use dimensional analysis to find the relationship between the force. We'll come back to what they are saying. So they are saying the force, which is F. So meaning I should go down there on my parameters and say force. And the variable is F. Let's carry on. The car. And then we also need the velocity V. Right. So we are dealing with another parameter, which is velocity. And they are saying let's represent it using V. What else? Well, they say the surface area of the car A. The surface area of the car. Okay, I think they wanted to say is A. So let's note it down. So we have the surface area. So we have area, surface area, which is denoted by A. Let's carry on. And the density of air. So we're given density, which is given by that. So let's come here and say density. It is given by that sign. OK. So let's go to step two. We have found our variables. Step two, we said write them or write the dimensions for those variables. That's your step two. So write the dimensions of the parameters. Okay, let's go ahead. So our force. So I'll come here and say parameter and then let's make something which is like a table. So I'll say parameter. Then we come here and we say dimension. So we have force, which is F. So I need someone to give me the dimensions of force. Click that unmute button, look at your table. And let's all be cooperative. Be active so that you do not sleep. What are the dimensions for force when you look at the table? You should be starting to use the table already. Please come closer to your mic. 
Give it a shot again. Okay, if anyone can can hear the gentleman, please speak on his behalf. I'm not sure if it's my mic, but he sounds very far. Yeah, he sounds very far. But he said MLT to the power negative two. So if you look at the dimensions for force, it is ML T to the minus two. Okay, great. So let's look for velocity. I need someone else there to give us velocity. You should not be sleeping. LT to the negative one. LT to the minus one. Let's go for surface area. Which is area. So what are the dimensions for area? L squared. L squared. And then let's look at density. ML to the minus three. So it is ML to the minus three. So there you go. After yeah, you reset, please sorry, go sorry. ahead. Sorry, yes. sorry, I wanted to. I wanted you to ask. Well, I wanted to ask where you find the table for the dimensions. So do you have the PDF of the mathematical modeling book? Oh yes, I have it, sir. Please go to the second last page. Oh, of the thank entire you so, so after having our step two, we now need to form a dimension, or we need to find the number of groups. So we'll stress about the number of groups when we now start finding two, three, or four. But lucky enough here, I can tell it's going to be one. So step three, we need to, let me zoom in, find the number of dimensionless groups. And if you remember, I said the number of dimensionless group or the number of groups will be equal to the number of parameters Minus the number, this I need you to be careful, number of dimensions present. So let's go and find this number of groups. So I need to calculate the number of parameters, which I listed, so I have one. I have two, I have three, I have four. So I have four parameters. And remember, the dimensions we are referring to T, M, and L. So now I need to go and look at my dimensions, all of them combined. The question I should be asking is, do I have a T somewhere? Of course, I do. Do I have an L somewhere when I look at all of them? Of course, I do. Do I have an M somewhere? Of course I do. So that means my dimensions is three of them. And my parameters is four of them. So it means the number of groups is just four minus three, which gives me one. And I said when we have one or zero, we are happy because all what we need to do, take all what is given, multiply it by each other, and then make the product to be dimensionless. What do we mean by make the product to be dimensionless? We are saying on the right hand side, make it M0, L0, and T0. So let's go ahead to our step four and form a dimensionless product.
So what do we mean by dimensionless product? We take those parameters which we were given. We were given force. We were given velocity. We were given surface area. We were given density. We multiply them to form a dimensionless product. What do we mean by dimensionless? What we mean is M0, L0, and T0. Then after multiplying them, we just assign exponents to them. So I have A, B, C, D. And then after doing this, I need to break them to their fundamental dimensions. So I'll say, write in fundamental dimension form. Sorry. Form. So meaning our F, if you look at what we have on the left hand side, where we see F, we should put M, L, T minus two, but this is raised to the power of A. Then when we see V, we put L, T minus one, this is raised to the power of B. Where we see A, which is the area, we need to put L squared to the power of C. And where we see density, we need to put ML minus three to the power of D. So I'll need to shrink this to make space. Okay, let's zoom in. And this should equal M0, L0, T0. Okay. And then now we need to distribute the exponents. So if you look carefully, our for the power of A, we will have M to the power of A, L to the A, T to the minus 2A. We are done with A. Let us go to B. It will be L to the B, T to the minus B, and then let's go to the C. It will be L to the 2C. Let's go to the D. It will be M to the D, and then L to the minus 3D. And this should give us M0, L0, and T0. Do we have any question? If there is no question, let's add another page and carry on with the problem. I'm really happy when I get questions. But since there are no questions, it means we are doing excellent work or you are paying attention and you are understanding. So let me quickly try this again, M0, L0, T0. So now what we need to do is to collect like terms. So we all remember from high school exponential laws. So let's start with L. Let's start with M since it came first. So we have M to the power of, we are doing products here. So we have M to the A, and then the next time we see M, it is to the power of D. And all of these quantities are multiplying one another in quotes. So when you multiply, same base, you add the exponents. So I should add A plus D. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's choose our L. So if you look at our L, it is to the power of A, it is to the power of B, it is to the power of 2c, it is to the power of minus 3d. When you multiply and have the same base, you must add all the exponents. So it means you must have a minus b, it is a plus b, sorry, 
and then plus 2c, then minus 3d. Then let's go ahead and look at the t. So if you look at the t, we have minus 2a and minus b. So we have minus 2a minus b, and this should equal m0, l0, t0. Okay. And then now we equate similar exponents. So if you look at our m, the m on the right hand side should have the same power as the m on the on the left hand side. The m on the left hand the l on the left hand side should have the same power as the l on the right hand side. And lastly, the t on the left hand side should have the same power as the t on the right hand side. Okay. So now we can start dealing with the m. So if you look at the m, there's the left hand side, and there's the right hand side. So if you look at the left hand side, we have a plus d, equals the right hand side is zero. So this means our a is equal to negative d. Okay, so here I'm gonna be faced with the problem where I have two options. I'll either represent everything in terms of D, since I have A is equal to negative D, or I can choose D or A, and then life becomes easy, but I'm going to choose the easiest value. You can choose one, because if you choose zero, then you mess up things. So anyone can unmute. Which one are you for? Should we choose or should we write everything in terms of D? Meaning our B will have to find a way to write it in terms of D. Our C also in terms of D. Which one are we for? So are you referring to A plus D equal to one zero? Sorry. Yes. So do you understand my question? I didn't get the last part, but the second part I got it. So so on the okay. previous problem, there was there was a smart gentleman who said, Why are we why are we taking that gap? And I said it makes your life to be easy the end of the day, you'll converge to the same answer. And then I revoked the choosing and I said, let's work with variables. And then we ended up getting to the same answer. So my question is, should we maintain that or should you we choose at the beginning? I think we can. Let's, uh, just write let's choose. Uh, let's choose D. I, I, yeah. Okay, so others are saying, let's choose others are saying, Let's let's write these in terms of D, because if you look at the two options, let me read the statement for you here. So I said we have two options. Option one, choose one variable, give it a simple value, say one. And then option two, which is this one, represent every variable in terms of one variable. So those are the two options which you, you have for you to get to the same solution. So what are you in the meeting saying? So uh, let's choose the ones. OK, um, so noted. There was a gentleman who wanted to talk. Also. The represent is written in the terms of one variable. Sir. OK, no problem. So, so here's what we they can do. They can all be represented in the variable of T. OK, can I say okay. Something? but can C be represented in the variable of D. You can. Yes, can I say something? Three over two D. Please, please go ahead. The, the one who's saying, can they say something? OK. A, a simple thing, Nese. So mm. in the end, are we going to say that A plus D will be equal to zero? A plus D is equal to zero. Oh, mm. oh. No, I mixed it. I saw A plus B. I thought it was A plus D. Sorry. OK, no problem. So let's carry on. The choosing part makes life to be easy, but even writing in one variable, it does not make life to be easy. Just put that, or it doesn't make life to be hard. Just put it in your head. Either way, it works. None is hard, and both of them are easy. So let's take L. In fact, before taking L, let me choose T. 
So let's take T. So if you look at T, the left hand side, it is saying minus 2A minus B, the right hand side is zero. So this means my B is minus 2A. Can you see that? But we said we want to represent everything in terms of D. So let's decide here. So let me say represent every variable in D. So if you look carefully, we have our B is equal to minus 2A. But minus, but A we know we can write in terms of D. So we can say minus 2, the A, we know it is minus D. So this just comes from here. So if you look carefully, our B then becomes 2D. Okay, so we now have our A in terms of D, our B in terms of D, all that is left is C, because D is D. So let's go to our L. And then you can go ahead. Is there someone who's asking a question? If yes, yes, please shoot. A plus B plus 2C minus 3D. This should be zero. Okay. So everything here I can represent in terms of D. So it's only C, which I don't know now. I know that my A is negative D. So I can put negative D here. And I know that my B, as you can see here, it is 2D. So I can say plus 2D. Then I have plus my 2C, then I have minus 3D, and this is zero. So when we collect these here, you will realize that we will have, let me see, that plus, then that. So if you look carefully, what we'll end up having is simply 2C minus 2D is equal to zero. And then when you solve, you'll see that your C should be equal to D. Okay. And then obviously, lastly, D is equal to D. There's nothing which we need to modify. So we have now written our C in terms of D, our B in terms of D, and where's our, our A in terms of D? So we are done. So now what we need to do is to copy the original expression and then start, start substitution. So where is that original expression? It is this one. And here we need to start sub substituting back. So we wrote our A in terms of D. So that means F, F, remember our A is negative D. So I'm going to put negative D here. And then V, our B is 2D. And then our A, our C is D, and then our P was raised to the D. And this should equal a dimensionless quantity. So I'm just going to call it K, where this is dimensionless. It is a dimensionless quantity. So if you look at what happens here when we start multiplying, is that we have V to D, then we have A to the D, then we have P to the D, and then we have over F to the D, which will be equal to K, where K is a dimensionless quantity. So if you look carefully, we can then factor out the D is an exponent. So we can have V squared and then A, that P over F, and all this is to the power of D, and this will equal to K, 
which is a dimensionless quantity. And when you are in cases like this, you can start maybe assuming, you can just say, assume D is one, it becomes easy. Or you can just take, or you can raise the right hand side, right hand side and the left hand side to one over D, the power. And then if you do that, it will cancel the one, the D on the right on the left hand side. So you'll be left with V squared area, density over force, and this will still be a dimensionless quantity. Let's call it K1. Okay, but now it's just a proportionality constant also. So the way we're saying we should solve for force, so we can make force the subject of the formula. So if you look carefully, when we solve for force, we need to divide by the one over K, K1, and then we have V squared A, and then we have the P. But obviously one over a constant is still a constant. Okay, so I'm just gonna choose the new constant and call it G where G is still a dimensionless quantity. And it's also AKA, it is just the proportionality constant. So if you look at what happens, our force will simply be our G times our V squared, our area, and our density. So now when they ask you, how is force related to velocity? You can just say force is directly proportional to the velocity. So let's quickly go back and see if we answered the question they were saying using you can mm -mm -mm, relationship between the force. Yep, so we just made force to be the subject. That's what they were looking for. Do we have anyone who has a question? Yeah, I yes. Can I talk Please or should I allow her to talk first? Okay, let's let's allow. I think she spoke first. Let's allow the lady to go ahead. Okay. Okay, can I add? If you for, let's say you forget to convert. Uh, let's say you forget to convert one of the to You just still get like the same. You still get mass times the. You. You mean, let's say you forgot, you forget to make one over K to be some other constant. Yeah. I do not think you will lose marks. You will, you will not, but you have an opportunity of not forgetting because you are seeing it now. So one over a constant is still another constant. Okay, it's like multiplying two with Oh, it is still a constant. I can just choose to call it K or maybe G combined. Does it make sense? So my short response is, I doubt you will lose marks, but you have an opportunity of not forgetting that one over a constant is a constant or a constant times a constant is a constant. So try by all means not to forget. If you do forget, I do not think they will take your marks for you not writing one over K as another constant. Okay, the gentleman can go ahead. Um, sir, uh, is the, okay, the product of the parameters that you've been given uh, the only way to determine the dimensions of any parameter that they ask you about? Or can we do it using addition, subtraction, or division? You you cannot you cannot do addition and subtraction. So think of this. Um, imagine a person who is 
And to think of an example, give me a second. So there's something which they call homogeneous parameters. So it's parameters where you can afford to do addition and nothing is going to be wrong. So think of you as trying to add, to add, let's say, bricks with milk. So those things are not homogeneous, so it's very hard to add them. You won't get something which has the same dimensions as both of them. So in summary, you are always going to be doing multiplication. At no point will you do addition. You're not going to add force with area. Imagine adding force with area. How do you do that? So <laughs> you are always like saying you are, it, it makes sense when you are adding area with area. Okay. Mm -hmm. The units at the end of the day, they are going to be meters squared. You can add them. When you are adding radius and parameter, at the end, the, 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 the units are going to be meters. But you can't add area with pressure. How do you, how do you add them? Okay, so uh, dimensional homogeneity is very important, ne? Exactly. So it is, okay. it is very important. So that's why we are not going to be adding different variables. You can add, for example, viscosity, and we are adding it to tension. It, it, it makes the brain to feel painful the more you think about it. So okay. thank you. So homogeneity is, is key. So we'll be doing multiplication instead of addition. You can only add parameters which are homogeneous, meaning they are of the same class. If we are speaking of area, as I can add them, but we are not going to add anything when we do dimensional analysis. All what we are going to be doing is to do this form a dimensionless product. We will never say sum. It will always be on step four, a dimensionless product, and you will just multiply them as we did, putting exponents, and then you go to your answer. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, great, good question. So this is gonna serve as, as homework. So obviously what you need to take here is you need to note the parameters. So let me take you halfway and then conclude. So we said step one, you must list the parameters. So if you look at what we have here, quickly have a run over this story. So atomic bomb, and then the destructive power energy of the bomb was classified, however, okay, time stamped, and then the radius, the power released by the identify the missing Parameter. Okay, so the easiest parameter which you can see here is that we are dealing with radius. We are trying to bomb people. And when you have the bomb, it should affect people within a certain radius. It, it's said that human beings are making bombs, but it is what it is. They bomb one another. So when you have a bomb, it can affect people within a certain radius. So there's a bomb which if we bomb it here, anyone who's within a radius of 15 kilometers is going to get blown away. So obviously, when we see here, we can see that radius is one of the parameters here. And then when you speak of bombs, you obviously need to speak of energy. So we come here, as we can see, we have energy. which we're just going to denote as E. Following the release of time-stamped pictures. So if you look carefully, I'm going to take a guess and say another variable of interest will be time. How long is it going to, or the impact going to last? Not the impact, in fact, the explosion. So I'll say time here, and time is denoted by T or by seconds, then the fundamental dimension will be T. 
and then estimate. Let me see, was able to estimate the power released by the explosion. Identify the missing parameter and use dimensional analysis to formulate the expression for energy. So anyone who has an idea, what is the missing parameter here? It is density. Okay, great. Density. You know, it feels like for for one to answer this question, they must be really following what parameters really matter in a bomb. But I think you know when you encounter when you encounter such questions and you are in an exam setting, just try to raise your hand when some things are puzzling. Maybe, maybe you might get help from one of the person who's in which later. Maybe they might say, you know, density also matters when you look at bombs. Okay. And then obviously what you do from here, the steps we have done them before, which is why I need you to do this as homework. Step number two would be obviously, if I remember right, this in their dimension form. Then we find the group. Then after the group, we then start formulating the product and then we are done from there. Okay. So obviously here, I am happy because your number of groups is going to be one. So you should go and figure that out. Okay. Do we have anyone who has a question? So remember that physics and maths, they are not a spectator spot. So you should also do some work. Uh, can I have a question, sir? Please go ahead. Um, may you please um, try to explain for question one, how you went about finding the number of dimensionless groups? OK. So for question one, I did not find the number of dimensionless groups. So I found it to be zero. Number of dimensionless groups, we need the number of parameters. We have one, two, three parameters, okay? And then we need the number of dimensions which appear on all the parameters combined. So if you look carefully, we have length appearing, we have mass appearing from this one, and we have time appearing from this one. So which means the fundamental dimensions, we have three of them. So we will now get three minus three, which gives us zero. But the zero here really has no meaning. It has no meaning because it, if you think carefully, it says you have zero dimensionless groups. So essentially, when you are given four or three parameters, the number of dimensionless groups will always be one. When you then do the product, you do not need to stress. So that's why I said, when you find the number of dimensionless groups and you find one, then do not stress. Carry on. When you find it to be one, sorry, that was zero. When you find it to be one, no stress. It is. The problem starts when you now find two or more. That's when now you need to consider those things which we were doing on Sunday. Now you need to stress about, I need to choose a geometric property. I need to choose a flow property. I need to choose a fluid property. It's just unfortunate that we do not have a problem at hand which assesses that. And I think you'll only be doing, or you'll only be dealing with those kind of problems the other week. Does this answer your question? Um, yes, it does. Okay. Any other question before we close? Your responsibility yes. from here is 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 doing this homework. This is not a spectator spot. We are not watching a show or anything. You should review the video, make sure you understand. This question should be very easy to answer. Please go ahead. Oh yes, yeah, so may you please go on the on question two would be like the solution there. 
Yes. Like, uh, yeah, I want to know like where like the FMT like vanished to because I only said like a V squared AP over F. Okay. So you are asking where did the D vanish to here? Yeah, yes. Yes. So essentially, if you look at the statement I said here, I said raise the right hand side to the power of one over D and the left hand side also. So what I meant was that you are gonna do something like this. Okay, you come here on the left hand side, you raise it to one over D, and then you raise the K1 to the one over D. Okay, and then what happens there is that the Ds are gonna cancel. Then when they cancel, you are left with this. And then the right hand side is a dimensionless quantity raised to a certain power, which is one over D. It is still gonna be a dimensionless quantity. I just chose to change it from K to K1 to show that the something which we did, but still it doesn't change the fact that it's a dimensionless quantity. Whether you square it, it doesn't change. As long as I didn't introduce any parameter which would introduce mass, time, or length, it is still dimensionless. So this statement here, I wrote a statement instead of doing the actual thing mathematically. Do you understand? Oh yes, yeah, I now see. Okay. Any other question? Please go ahead. Things will not start being simple or making sense after the session. Instead of asking your friend what I was saying, you might as well ask me. Can can you please go back to the last page for question three? In question three, yeah. Okay, thank you. You can go back. Okay, let me delete these pages and this one. Okay, anyone with a question, please go ahead. I'm readily waiting for questions. Questions are what I like. Hello, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Um, I don't understand step three where we are determining the number of groups and the uh, fundamental dimensions. Okay. So the question is, what do you, let's come here. I'll need you not to mute yourself. We should have a conversation. So there's my step three. Okay, so step three says the number of parameters. Do you understand what we mean by number of parameters? Do we mean the number of um, variables that we have? Yes, so it's the number of the things which we could spot from the question. We spotted that what plays a factor in this problem is force, we spotted velocity, we spotted area and density. So they become four, meaning the number of parameters is four. Okay. Yes. And then afterwards, we say number of groups is the number of parameters which you should list. You should read the problem and list the parameters which are relevant. Those will be the number of parameters minus the number of dimensions present. By dimensions, remember we are referring to T, M, and L. These are dimensions. So I now go to where I wrote this in dimension form. Okay, all my variables, I ask myself, do I have a T? Of course I do have a T, I can see a T in one of these. Do I have an L somewhere in these variables? Of course, I can see an L and here and here, so L is there. I tick it. Do I see an M? Of course, M is here, M is here. So the number of dimensions present, it is three. That's why I have three of mine here. Okay. Uh, so if we only had a T and L, we would have had um, two. Yes. So let's say, for example, we remove our M and M here. So I would check, do I have the, the T? Yes. Do I have the L? Yes. Do I have the M? The answer would be no. So my D would turn out to be two. So I would have two, I would have four minus two, 
which would give me two groups. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Thank you. Yes, so that's how we mine those. Do you have anyone else who has a question? Please go ahead. Your question is going to help your classmate. In fact, your classmate has the same question they are just scared to ask. So please go ahead for your sake. So I have a um, question. Okay, let's start with the gentleman who said they have a question, then the gentleman who said arm will follow. Who was first? I'm confused. It's the guy who said I have a question, then another one followed and said arm. Okay. Uh, when will you have a special like semester one for the lectures? Since you said you love questions. Okay, please. Please repeat your question again. Uh, I mean, when will the specials run? Since you said uh, you love questions. Like if oh. I want to attend online. Oh, so that is going to be starting this Saturday. So the aim is, is as such. So people should be prepared for quizzes which they write every week. So I believe Sundays work best. I will check with the admin. The admin will 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 communicate. But Sundays the not such Sundays, sorry, Saturdays they work best because the aim is to be consistent in in working because there's people who are suffering from procrastination. So if you push them to work on a weekly basis, they are always up to date. So the admin will communicate those um ASAP. But I would like to believe we are looking at Saturdays because during the week it's really tight. So it just so happens that this week is not busy because it's the first week. But otherwise, when you go into second week and so, you will not have time during the week. Another one, please, the second gentleman, go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to ask for question three, how did you possibly know that the missing parameters density? In fact, where is the gentleman who gave us density? They should come and answer. They are on record. If they keep silent and they're in the meeting, we are going to come for them. I'm kidding. The gentleman who said density, please go ahead. We are still in the meeting. Uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't really, um, actually I, I'm, I did the question prior, so I knew um, I did not know how. Actually, when I first did the question, I did not know which um, which which uh, I did not know which was the missing uh, variable. Mm -hmm. Are you still there? We're still in the meeting. Oh, so you did not hear me. Yeah, so I was I, I, I heard you in, when when you were saying now you are audible. You were saying at first you did not know. Yeah. Yes. So so let me let me come in to your to your rescue. So what's going on is with, with some problems. It's really hard to know in advance when you have no idea of, of how something works. It's like asking a person who does not know how cars work and you say to them, which kind of oil should we put in? If automatically when you speak of oil, they think of cooking oil or they do not even think of oil which you put in cars, it's not wrong of them. So I think this, this question rather was, it needed one to know bombs in general it's weird that also when they quantify the damage a bomb can do they also include density so that's why i was saying earlier if you find yourself in a situation where you can't spot the variable and you have no idea of the application i think it's useful to just raise your hand up and then try to ask maybe the person you're gonna ask is gonna be kind enough to say 
We actually need tension here. Or maybe you need talk. Whatever the problem is. But it's very hard to predict in advance what variables are applicable to a problem because problems are unique. But believe me, most of the time you are not going to be given problems which have variables which are missing. You'll be given all the variables and then it is for you then to start figuring things out. Okay. Any other question, please make them to come my way. If there are none, we can call the meeting the end. And I really urge you to review. Please go ahead. Sir, um, I just wanted to find out now. Say, for instance, um, after identifying the dimensions, I find that there's only two dimensions. And then now I have to equate it to, to equate them like to the dimensionless um, quantities. So I wanted to find out if, let's say, I only found the dimensions to be time and maybe length. So when I equate them to the dimensionless, do I have to only mention the two dimensionless, which is time and length, or I still have to mention the three of them? You like m to the power to zero, t to the power zero, and l to the power zero. You still have the two of them, the three of them. So let's say, for example, you have a situation like this. Then you have l, and then let's say you have t squared. Then you have c, you have B and then you have A. So my right hand side would be M to the zero, T to the zero, L to the zero, which means since I don't see M here, it means it's already taken care of. It is already M to the zero. That's why I can't see it. So this is oh, nice okay. balance. Oh, okay, okay, sir. Thank you. No problem. Another one. Ask your question yeah, or please forever. Please go ahead. I have a math question. It's not applied physics. What, what is it about? It's about infinity. Uh, do, do we have numbers which exist after infinity? Well, maybe the question you should be asking yourself is what is infinity? Yes, I know what infinity is. I'm just wondering. Well, there's, there's there's an argument where people are saying there's bigger infinities. So there's an infinity which is less than another infinity. There's bigger infinities. So oh, as long okay. as as long Thank as you. we have infinity, you will never have a fixed defined number which is greater than infinity because the smaller infinities, there's bigger ones. Makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. No problem. It sounds like you should have done PSC. Because engineers really do not stress about infinity. Infinity apparently to engineers is a big number, which is it's really not. Yep. Or many so, like questions like uh, the, the fourth dimension when you're dealing with vectors, it's for PSC. Mm -hmm. So you are only going to do that if, um, let me see, the you won't do that when you are doing engineering, engineering mathematics. So the most complex part you will face uh -huh. when you deal with more dimensions is if you are going to do either MIA or electrical. So in fact, it's these two to be specific. So if you are going to do arrow, or make, or you are going to do electrical trades. That's when at third year level, you will find yourself doing dealing with some interesting maths where you can easily say you are dealing with the third, not the third, but the fourth dimension. You'll see when you do, there's something they call mapping. You'll see it if you are doing the two. But if you are not, I think you can push the dimensions aside and focus on moving code. But if you are doing aero or MEC or electrical, not information, you will need to do, deal with some interesting meds at third year level. Mm, okay, thank you. No problem. Any other question, please go 